Way too long. So goodbye now, yellow brick road. To lie, what I need is back home. So homeward I'm traveling and in the unraveling, farther unraveling. When I can't breathe, I think have mercy. Pretty sure at this point. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good to be with all of you this morning. Let's stand as we sing our opening song here. Let's worship together.
gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of His name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, and his prisoner free. His blood can make the violence free, his blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb, loosens tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. Glory to God and praise and love be ever, ever given. By saints below and saints above, the church in earth and heaven. By saints below and saints above, the church in earth and heaven. Amen, amen. You may be seated, Chase. All right, good morning, Trailhead. It's good to see everyone, brothers and sisters in Christ here today. Uh, my name is Chase Reagan. For those of you who don't know me, I'll be doing the call to worship uh, here today. If you are new to the church, please, in the, in the pews, there's connect cards. Please get them filled out and get them turned in to Heidi at the Welcome Center there, uh, the entrance of the, the church. Um, Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship here uh, today. Um, in your pew Bibles on page 955, uh, I would like to read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Uh, again, it's on page 955. Um, when I first heard that Pastor Mark was preaching on the uh, second chapter of John, when Jesus clears the temple, the scripture that was put on my heart was this, scripture in, in uh, Corinthians, and the context here is sexual immorality. However, the context of Pastor Mark's sermon today is Jesus tells uh, his followers that uh, the temple will be destroyed and will be rebuilt again in three days, but he was referring to, of course, his body being the temple. <clears throat> well, brothers and sisters in Christ, our own bodies our temples as, as well. And let's go ahead and read uh, this passage here together. <clears throat> Again, this is uh, Apostle Paul in the writing to the church in Corinth. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Praise God for that, that the Holy Spirit is in us. If you're trusting in Christ here today with us, the Holy Spirit is in you. And therefore, our body is a temple. And so how do we, how do we take care of our body? We have physical means, but we also have spiritual means. What happens if we go without bread or water for three or four days? We deteriorate, right? If we go without the daily bread of our Savior Jesus our spiritual life also deteriorates. It's very profound. My brother TJ teaching our youth here, I'm going to steal this from him. Uh, he said there's so many false hospitals out there uh, that we rely on spiritually, right? Uh, granted, there's some good hospitals out there that uh, God's providence has put out there um, uh, to help us get healed and whatnot, but the false, the false hospitals he's referring to is all those false idols that we we focus in on instead of the bread of life. Um, John 6, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to this world. John 6, 48, I am the bread of life. 
John 6, 51, I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much for this day, for the ability to come together uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ to worship you, Lord. We thank you for the salvation that comes in in, in our faith in you, Lord. Um, we thank you for your word, your bread of life. For in the beginning, the word was with God. The word was God, Lord, and we thank you for that. We ask that you open our hearts, open our minds here to receive your word and to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Are there some kids here today who can come on up for our children's message? Well, good morning. Again, to some of you, some of you I've already seen this morning. How's everybody doing? Pretty good? All right. Well, this morning, I'm wondering if you can help me think of a word that I'm missing. So in the book of Romans, that's one of the books in the Bible, in, the, in chapter 3, verse 23, it goes like this. For all have and fall short of the glory of God, except I forgot a word. Do any, do, is there, I know I can get some help out there, but is there anybody up here who knows what that word would be? For all have, I'll give you a hint, it starts with an S. S that's a good S word. Not the one I was looking for. For all have, it's a problem. Can you guys think of a problem that we all have that starts with a S? Or I might need some adult help. Okay, adults. For all have sinned. Who knows what sin is? Anybody up here tell me what sin is? What's, what's sin? Is sin the good things that we do? Nope. Sin is the bad things, the problems. And that verse said that all have sinned. Does that really mean everybody? It does. Is there anybody sitting in here today who doesn't have that problem? No, everybody. We all have sinned. So what I'm going to talk about just for a moment is how God helps us with our sin problem because we all have the same problem. So in this book right here, who knows how many parts are there in this book? Two. That's exactly right. There's the first part, which is called the Old Testament, and then we have the New Testament. That's exactly right. Good job. And guess what? God helps the people in the Bible in different ways. In the Old Testament, do you guys know how God helped them with their sin? What did the, what did the people in the Old Testament have to do in order to have their sins be forgiven by God? Do any of you know? Okay, well, you, I'll tell you. Guess what they had to do? They had to go to the temple, and they had to bring animals, and they had to kill the animals so that their sins would be forgiven. Did you guys know that? Did you guys out there know that? Yeah, that's what they had to do in the Old Testament. But guess what? In the New Testament, it's different, and it's better. Do you guys know who enters the scene when we get to the New Testament? His name starts with a J. John comes. That's right. He comes first. And then Jesus, two J's right in a row. Who knew? Yes, that's right. Jesus enters the scene when we get to the New Testament. And do you want to know what? All the things they had to do in the Old Testament in order for their sins to be forgiven, all of a sudden, 
Jesus did it for them. Jesus became, he was the lamb of God. So in the Old Testament, they had to kill animals. They had to kill lambs in order for their sins to be forgiven. But when Jesus came, what did Jesus come to do? What did he do? He didn't, how did our, their sins get forgiven? What did Jesus have to do for our sins to be forgiven? He had to, he had to die on a cross. And when Jesus died, all of the old ways of being forgiven, they were all done away with. They didn't have to sacrifice animals anymore because Jesus became the lamb of God. So we don't have to bring animals anymore. Isn't that good news? We can just go right to Jesus because he died. He was the lamb for us. Okay, let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much that you came and you changed everything for us. We thank you that you died the perfect death and that we can come directly to you to be forgiven of our sins. We no longer have to go to the temple and follow all these rules and regulations. Father, you sent Jesus in place of all of that, and we thank you for that. I pray these kids would come to understand that and see how incredible your plan was for each of them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's stay in church as we sing 10,000 Reasons this morning. Sing, Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord Bless the Lord, oh my soul His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship your holy name Your rich in love And your slow to anger Your name is great your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his hope like never before oh my soul i worship your holy and on that day when my strength is failing the entrance and my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unhand. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. 
worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i worship your holy name one more time bless the lord bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, Lord, I worship your holy name, God, I worship your holy name. God, we worship your name this morning. You're worthy of our praise. So, Lord, we just lift our voice to you this morning. Be glorified in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. It is great to be with you here today. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Mark Rolovs. I'm the pastor here at the church. <clears throat> Just going to get situated here a moment. Um, a couple weeks ago, I think it was actually three weeks ago now, Jim Miller um, he is a retired pastor from Linden, Washington. Some of you have met Jim and Kathy. They weren't able to be here this morning, but he preached for me that day because I was under COVID lockdown or quarantine or restriction or whatever you want to call it. Um, wasn't able to be here at church with you that day. And so I've been meaning the last couple of weeks to thank him. Now this morning, he's not able to be here, but I wanted to just say thank you, Jim. I think that they're watching at home online um, through Facebook Live. So thank you to Jim Miller for preaching at pretty short notice that week. Um, I appreciated that a great deal. The text that I'm going to be reading today is John chapter 2, and I'm going to be reading verses 12 through verse 25. I would invite you to turn there with me in your Bibles. <clears throat> If you are following along in a pew Bible, it's page 887. The book of John, chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 12. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John the Apostle says these words. After this, he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. And they stayed there for a few days. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to each of us here today. Would you bow your heads now in prayer with me as we continue to worship the Lord together this morning? Dear Father, this morning we come to you and we acknowledge that you are our refuge, and you, God, are our strength. Dear Father, we praise you for that truth. And dear Father, we acknowledge that we need a refuge in these times. Dear Father, this morning, we give you praise that you are on the throne. And Father, we praise you that Christ is seated at your right hand, interceding even for us. Dear Father, we thank you for the hope that that gives us. And Father, we praise you for the hope that we have that one day Christ will return and he'll set everything straight. Father, we repeat these truths often here in this church here, when we're gathered together. And Father, we repeat them 
Because if anyone else is like me, we forget them. And we need to be reminded. So dear Father, we praise you for these truths. Dear Father, this morning we do pray for our country. We pray for our nation's leaders. Dear Father, we pray for our president and vice president. Father, we pray for our new governor. Dear Father, we praise you for, we pray this morning for our local leaders. Dear Father, we know that ultimately it's only through the power of your word, it's only through the power of the gospel that change will be brought about. So Father, we pray that your gospel would move forward in power, that your spirit would be moving and working in power this morning, bringing conviction of sin, causing people to repent and turn to Christ for salvation. Your Father, we pray that that would even take place here in this meeting place. Your Father, this morning we want to pray for the churches of Broadwater County. We want to pray for the Alliance Bible Church. Your Father, we pray for Pastor Eric. In the leadership there, your father, would you minister through him powerfully this morning as he proclaims your word? Your father, would you continue to bring unity to the body there? Your father, even as we pray for unity, continued unity in this body, your father, that the Alliance Bible Church would be like a city on a hill? Your father, that the watching world would see Christ through them. Your Father, we ask that same truth. We, we ask for that to be true of our body as well. Dear Father, this morning we pray for the needs of this church. Once again, Father, we acknowledge that they are many. We want to pray for Ray, Mike Banks' brother-in-law, who is dealing with cancer. This morning we pray for Helene Van Dyken and Andy Van Dyken. We pray for Brian Raymond. We pray for Willis Hosfeld. We pray for Colton Cora White. Your Father, in each of these situations, we pray for your healing. We pray that you'd be ministering to each of these people, to each of the families that are represented. Father, that you would be reminding them of your love for them and your presence with them even this morning. Dear Father, we pray for our dear brother Eric Forey as he is grieving the loss of his dad, Ernie, this past week. Dear Father, would you be ministering powerfully to Eric and Lacey and their family this morning? Dear Father, we are so grateful that you are the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others with the same comfort that we have received from you. Dear Father, we praise you that we grieve. Scripture even tells us it's good for us to grieve. It's normal for us to grieve. But Father, we praise you that we don't grieve as those who don't have hope. We grieve as those who do. So Lord, I pray that you'd be filling Eric and his family even this morning with hope. The hope that comes from you. Lord, as we look at your word now, we do pray that you would speak. Speak, O oh Lord. May your word, your living word, accomplish what you desire in our lives today. We love you and we give you praise. And all God's people said, Amen. One of the best basketball players of all time. Kobe Bryant passed away just over a year ago. January 26, 2020, it was a Sunday, I remember yet, I still remember grabbing my coat from upstairs after church and everybody had left. I remember grabbing my phone, glancing at it, seeing the update, Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter accident with his daughter and a number of others. It is no overstatement to say that Kobe Bryant was passionate about the game of basketball. Even if you weren't a basketball fan, 
Probably many of you that are here today, if you're not a basketball fan, you probably knew that about Kobe Bryant. Basketball had consumed much of his life. At Kobe's memorial service, Michael Jordan, arguably the greatest basketball player of all time, said this about Kobe in his passion. He used to call me or text me at 11.30, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, talking about post-up moves, footwork, and sometimes the triangle. I have no idea what the triangle was, but at first, it was an aggravation, and then it turned into a certain passion. This kid had a passion like you would never know. It's an amazing thing about passion. If you love something, if you have strong passion for something, you would go to the extreme to get it. Ice cream, Cokes, hamburgers, whatever you have a love for. If you had to walk, you would go get it. If you had to beg someone, you would go hard to get it. He wanted to be the best basketball player he could be, close quote. Speaking of his passion, the Apostle Paul said this about himself in Philippians chapter 1, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Then later on in Philippians chapter 3, he says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing with him in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Does that remind you a little bit of Kobe Bryant and his passion? Does that sound like passion to you? Yeah, it does to me too. So I ask you these questions as we really get into the sermon today. What are you passionate about? I'm going to give you a moment to think about that. What are you passionate about? What consumes you? Much like the game of basketball consumed Kobe Bryant, much like knowing Christ consumed the Apostle Paul, what consumes you? For what would you give your blood and your treasure? And then let me ask you this, this question. Is what you are devoted to worthy of your life? And how many of us ever really think about things that way? Today, I want to help us see that Christ is worthy of all of our passion. Indeed, he alone is worthy of our lives. Roman numeral number one in your notes is this. The summary for today's message is this. See and savor the glory of Christ, the Lamb of God, the true temple. Let me say that for you one more time. See and savor the glory of Christ, the Lamb of God, the true temple. Now, before I go on, I want to explain to you what the word savor means, because that's not a word that we use often. Just like last week, I used the word behold, and I used some other words last week that maybe we don't oftentimes think about. The word savor means to linger in the enjoyment of that particular thing. Linger in the moment of enjoying whatever it is you're savoring. 
And I know because we live in Montana, some of you are thinking about that New York strip steak, right? And if you think about how you would savor a steak, you would linger and enjoy it. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to talk about this because it takes me an hour to eat my food, ask my wife. I'm a slow, slow eater. So I just enjoy everything that I eat anyway. I, you could say that I'm savoring my food. And in the same way that we think about savoring our food, I'm saying, see and savor the glory of Christ. Linger in the moments of enjoying his greatness. Roman numeral number two, John chapter two, verses 12 through 25, can easily be broken down into three sections, and that's what I've done for you today. The first section is this. Jesus cleanses the temple during the Passover. That's number one in your notes under Roman numeral number two. Jesus cleanses the temple during the Passover. Now, before we go on, it's good for us to understand what Jesus, what John is telling us when he talks about the Passover. That, that's something that they would take for granted, but it's good for us to understand what is the Passover? What is the Passover? And Beth talked about it a little bit ago with the children. That, that was really, really beneficial. I'm going to remind you of some of the things that she already has said. The Passover was the commemoration, the celebration of God's deliverance of his people from Egypt. I think probably most of you already know that. And if you don't know that, that's okay. That's what I'm here for. That's what the Passover ultimately was. It was this commemoration, this celebration of God's deliverance of his people from Egypt. If you go back to the book of Exodus chapter 12, we would see this is where the Passover started. The, the Passover lamb before the 10th plague came upon Egypt, the death of the firstborn. God tells Moses to tell the people to kill the lamb and then with the hyssop branch to put the blood on the lintel and on the doorpost. I have no idea what a lintel is, but that's what they were commanded to do. It had something to do with the door. Probably all of you already know what a lintel is. They were commanded to put the blood of the lamb on the lintel and the doorpost. The Lord, we know this, right? The Lord would pass over the homes that had the blood there. The homes that didn't have the blood, the firstborn was killed. That was the plague. But the Israelites were spared because they all did it. That night, the Israelites would be delivered from Pharaoh. They were delivered from the Egyptians. The Israelites were delivered by God. Now, in regards to the Passover, it was this feast that they were to celebrate every year. It, it was a one-night celebration, and then, and then it was the, the Feast of, of Tabernacles that would come after that. That was celebrated for a week. And in, in Israel, all of the Jewish males were required to come to Jerusalem, to make a trip to Jerusalem, to celebrate the Passover every year. And that's good for us to take note of here this morning. There were many that were coming from all over the Roman Empire because the Jews, you might remember, through their captivity had been scattered. So there were Jews that were coming from all over the Roman Empire back to Jerusalem for the Passover. They would need to purchase animals when they got there for sacrifice and also for their feasting. They would also need their currency converted if their currency was different wherever they lived. That's good for us to take note of this morning as we continue with this story. Now look with me at verse 14. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers 
sitting there. Now, now before we go on, again, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, but I want to explain the temple just for a moment. The temple was the place where God and believers would meet. Again, I think probably most of us are aware of this, but it's good for us just to review. The temple was the house of God. The house of God. The symbol of God dwelling with his people. Sacrifices were made here to atone for sin. God accepted people here because of bloody sacrifices. Look with me now at verses 15 and 16. And making a whip of cords, he, Jesus, drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Now at a time like this, it behooves us to ask the question, why did Jesus do this? Doesn't it? Isn't that a good question for us to ask? Right now, why did Jesus do this? I think it's a really good question. So we're going to go with it. First of all, Jesus did this because of his concern for the purity of the worship in the temple. That makes good sense, doesn't it? Jesus is concerned about the purity of the worship in the temple. Jesus doesn't want the merchants, the money changers, and the animals in the house of God. He doesn't want them there. The temple was to be set apart as holy because it was the house of God. Those who were doing business in the temple, even business necessary for the worship of God, were misusing his dwelling place. And so Jesus comes in there and he pushes them all out. I wanted to share with you this quote by D.A. Carson, and I believe it'll be up on the screen. In explaining the situation, he says, Instead of solemn dignity and the murmur of prayer, there is the bellowing of cattle and the bleeding of sheep. You can almost hear it, can't you? Okay, my cow is better than my sheep, and that's because I grew up in northwest Iowa. But you can almost hear that, right? Imagine coming to church some Sunday and hearing those sounds. Instead of brokenness and contrition, holy adoration and prolonged petition, there is noisy commerce. It is. What Jesus did here was a prophetic invitation to worship God from the heart without clamor or distracting influences. That is so good. And I think it applies to us beyond even this text. And I ask the question of myself, do I have daily times of... Worship, daily times in the Lord's presence, where I'm worshiping him from the heart without clamor, without distracting influences? And I would ask all of us the same thing. Do we avail ourselves of the means of grace? Being in his presence, reading his word, spending time in prayer without clamor or distracting influences? It's a good question for us today. And then another question that follows is, do we have regular time for worship with brothers and sisters in Christ? And I'm not saying only on Sundays. Time to worship God from the heart without clamor or distracting influences. So first of all, Jesus cleanses the temple because of his concern for purity of the worship in the temple. Second, and this is not as 
clear from the text, but I believe it's true nonetheless, is that Jesus is the Lamb of God. Just what Beth was sharing with the children 20 minutes ago, 25 minutes ago. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Think about that with me for a moment. Isn't that what John the Baptist called him twice? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's no more need for these animal sacrifices. I know I already got excited about that last week. And I need to get excited about it again this week. Jesus is the Lamb of God. There is no more need for all of these animals, for all of these sacrifices. Hebrews 9 verse 28 says this, So Christ was sacrificed once, once, once to take away the sins of many people. He doesn't need to be sacrificed more than once. Once is enough. The sacrificial system with its bloody sacrifices was fulfilled by Christ. Fulfilled by Christ. It all pointed to him. It all pointed to him. Jesus would be the lamb whose blood would be shed so sin could be atoned for and people could be reconciled to God. That is great, great news for us today. And my question for each of us that are gathered here today is this. Have you come to Christ as the Lamb of God whose blood was shed for your sin? Have you? Are you trusting Christ as the Lamb of God for your sin today? Look with me at verse 17. His disciples, Jesus' disciples, remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal here is a fervent passion that will consume his life. A fervent passion that will consume Jesus' life. The disciples here are remembering A psalm, Psalm 69, verse 9. It's a psalm of David, speaking of David and David's commitment to the temple. Even though David wasn't officially the one who would build the temple, right? That was going to be Solomon, his son. But David helped with the preparation. And David was committed to the temple. Now, we're not sure when Jesus' disciples remembered this. Verse 17. We're not sure when he when they remembered Psalm 69, verse 9. Zeal for your house will consume me. And I say we don't know for sure when they remembered that because there are other places where John says they remembered this. In fact, we're going to read it later in this text. They, they didn't really remember this until much later, until after Jesus was raised from the dead. So we don't know when his disciples remembered this, they probably at that moment were focused on Jesus' zeal as demonstrated in his cleansing of the temple. That's probably what they were really thinking about at that time. Wow, Jesus, he really was zealous in his actions. Now imagine with me for a moment what it would have been like to have been a disciple of Jesus. You just started following this man right, who is the Lamb of God. You don't even really understand everything that that means. And he goes into the temple, the central point of the Jewish religion, and he upsets everything. He, he overturns the tables of the money changers, and he drives out all the animals. This was no small commotion. Do you see that? <laughs> Imagine being one of Jesus' disciples, and you're like, I don't know what's going on here, but yeah, we're with him. Maybe they were kind of hiding at that time. (laughs) Yeah, I guess we're with him. I don't know. I'm speculating. But imagine what that would have been like. The, The center of the Jewish religious system, Jesus goes in there and totally upsets everything. No small commotion. No small commotion. Later, I believe it was later, I believe it was quite a bit later, the disciples realized this quote from Psalm 69 was a reference, a reference to Jesus' death. 
zeal for your house will consume me. This was Jesus' passion. I talked a little bit earlier about passion. This was Jesus' passion. This was his purpose. This was his mission. This was his aim. This is what drove him in life. To lay down his life as the Lamb of God. And so I ask each of us this morning, even as we think about Christ's zeal, as we think about his passion, would people look at your life, would they look at my life and say that my passion, your passion, my purpose, your purpose, your mission, my mission, your aim, my aim, what drives you in life, what drives me in life is to know Christ. Would people say that about us? Moving on to number two in your notes. Second section of scripture, verses 18 through 22. Jesus in the temple of his body. These next two sections are much smaller than the first one. Jesus in the temple of his body. Look with me at verse 18. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? What sign? They use the word sign. And I believe they're using it in a little different way than John uses the word sign. They're saying, what authority, what are your prophetic credentials? In other words, what gives you the right to come and upset our whole temple? Do you see that? By what authority are you doing these things? They're saying, Jesus, who do you think you are? It's a fair question, isn't it? Some guy goes in there, turns, does all this commotion. Who in the world does he think he is? Look with me at verses 19 through 21. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus, let her be in your notes there, Jesus is the true temple. The ultimate purpose, brothers and sisters, the ultimate purpose of the temple was to point to Christ. Do you understand that? Nod your heads with me. Even if you don't, it's okay. Just nod your heads. It's good for blood flow and staying awake and stuff. Jesus is the true temple. The ultimate purpose of the temple was to point to Christ, the true and better meeting place with God. The true and better meeting place with God. Jesus is the fulfillment of all that the temple meant in the center of of true worship. I know I've used this before. I'm at the risk of overusing it, but does anyone else just feel like hashtag mind blown? It, it, really? I mean, it's the Lamb of God, the true and better temple. Have you thought those things when you've read this story before? I have to say, these are some new ways of thinking for me. And it blows my mind. D.A. Carson had this to say about this text. In this temple, the ultimate sacrifice would take place. Within three days of death and burial, Jesus Christ, the true temple, would rise from the dead. Jesus is speaking here of his death and resurrection. I guess by now that's obvious, right? He's talking about his death and resurrection. But the Jews don't understand. They're thinking in terms of what they can see. They're, term they're thinking about material things, of natural things, what they could see with their physical eyes and understand with their natural minds. 
what, it took us 46 years to build this thing and you're going to tear it down and then rebuild it? In three days? This guy's nuts. That's probably what they're thinking. Look with me at verse 22. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Once again, we see they're remembering later, after Jesus' resurrection, okay, now it makes sense to us. That's what he was talking about. You see what John is saying there? Oh, it, it was later, and then, oh yeah, the disciples remembered this, and then it made sense to them. Again, I said it last week, I'm going to say it again this week. It's encouraging to me to see that the disciples' faith was a work in progress. Is that encouraging to any of the rest of you that are here today? <laughs> Thank you. I got, a, I got some hearty amens from over here. I'm not sure about this section. Um, our faith is a work in progress. I, I, I said it last week, and I don't want there to be misunderstanding about that. There are days where I say to the Lord, where I need to, in fact, probably almost every day, probably every day, if not every hour, I need to say to the Lord, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And what I'm saying there is, I do believe in the gospel. I believe in what Jesus Christ did for me. It's just that sometimes I don't believe in the implications of the gospel. I, I don't necessarily believe that I no longer have to earn his favor, that, that, that my relationship with God is secure because of Christ's completed work on the cross. There are times I forget that. And I think if we're honest, we would all say, yeah. Yeah, sometimes I forget that my identity is secure because of Christ. I don't need to put my identity in, in being the best pastor that ever lived. The, the greatest preacher to ever grace a pulpit. I, I, don't, I don't need to look to that, although I do want to do my best, yes. But I don't need to find my identity there. My identity is secure in Christ, his finished work. So it's encouraging to me to see that the disciples' faith is a work in progress. Number three, section number three in this text, Jesus and man, verses 23 through 25. Look with me at verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Many believed when they saw the signs. Now, 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 some of you right now are saying, how many signs has he already done? I can only count one. <laughs> he turned the water into wine, right? And, and John is telling us signs, plural. There were, it, it says in, in verse 23, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. Well, it's good for us to remember in John chapter 20, John says, Jesus performed many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't recorded in this book. They're not all here. And so there may have been other signs after the water into wine. We know that that was the first one. There may have been other signs. It's really not that important. But it's good for us to catch that. Many believed when they saw the signs. Verse 24 and 25. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in a man. What was in man. Let her be as Jesus did not entrust himself to them. He didn't entrust himself to them. Not yet. Not yet. Jesus knew, this verse 25 tells us, Jesus knew what was in man. There's a sense here that most likely these were not true believers. Some of them may have been, we don't know for sure, but there's a sense here, and I think this is very well supported, 
that these were most likely not true believers, but they were temporarily attracted to him because of his signs. Do you see how that could be possible? They were temporarily attracted to him because of the signs that he had performed. Think about it with me. In John chapter 6, when Jesus talks about how they need to eat his flesh and drink his blood, what happens? Many of them left him. Were they true believers? No. Were they following him for a while? Yes. Did they believe in his name because of the signs? Probably. The point is, they were attracted to him temporarily because of the signs they had seen. There will come a time when Jesus will entrust himself to those who truly trust him. But not yet. We'll see that later in John. He will. He will entrust himself. But not yet. And so my question for us here today is this. Are we temporarily attracted to Christ because of something we hope that Jesus would do for us? Like a cosmic genie? It's a good question, isn't it? It's a serious question. It's a sober question. Actually, I don't believe that that's true for every one of you that I know. I don't believe that that's true. But I think it's a good question for us to ask. Are we temporarily attracted to Christ because of something we hope he'll do for us? Some kind of way that he'll improve our lives? Give us something that would make our life better, deliver us from some problem that we're facing? Or, or are we coming to him on his terms? Approaching him as the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God whose blood was shed to make atonement for your sin. The true temple, the true and better meeting place with God. That doesn't mean that we can't pray for Jesus to to help us with issues that we're dealing with or or wants in our lives or things that we think we need. that's, That's not my point at all. I don't want you to hear that wrong at all. It's just that sometimes it's difficult for us to discern. And it's good for us to ask that question. Roman numeral number three. How do we apply this text? First of all, we see and savor the glory of Christ. We see and savor the glory of Christ. Once again, when we talk about his glory, we're talking about his awe-inspiring greatness. His awe-inspiring greatness that we see even in this text. See it. And in order for us to see it, we need to have spiritual eyes, don't we? To see. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. So do you have eyes to see and then to savor the glory of Christ? Ian do good. A biblical scholar said these words. Ponder the mysteries. Roll around on your tongue the new wine of the way God has fulfilled his promises in Jesus. Savor the fullness, the depth, and the surprising and fresh glory of what God has done. This is better than any novel, better than any drama, better than any fantasy. This is the true tale of how the prince, born with neither crown, with neither throne nor crown, showed that he loved his bride enough to die for her, and by dying for her, he regained his rightful throne was crowned as king and liberated his bride from the oppressive powers holding her captive. There is no better story than the true one. That's good stuff. So 
So first, see and savor the glory of Christ. Second, believe in Christ. Believe in Christ for salvation. If you're here today and you're not believing in all this talk about Jesus being the the Lamb of God, the true and better temple, I would encourage you to come and talk to me. I would love to talk with you after this service is over. But even before this service was over, I would say, I, I implore you to trust Christ. Be reconciled to God right now. Turn from your sin. Repent. Turn from your sin. Trust Christ. Trust that he took the punishment that you deserve. The punishment that we all deserve. So that we could have life. The punishment punishment that we deserve is eternal hell. Eternal separation from the love of God. Are you trusting Christ, throw yourself. When I say trust, I mean throw yourself on him. Throw yourself on this truth. So believe in Christ for salvation, but believe in Christ for daily life, for every day. And we talked about this last week. I'm not going to go into that anymore. Number three, ask Christ Ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to increase our zeal, our passion for him. It's been said that we become like what we worship. We become like what we worship. That's why I started with application point number one. See and savor the glory of Christ. As we do that, as we see and savor the glory of Christ, our zeal, I believe, will increase. I believe our zeal will increase because we will become more and more like Christ. If it's true that we become like what we worship, if 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 is true, That as we behold Christ, we are conformed to Christ. We become like Christ. As we become like him, our zeal for him will increase. But I also believe asking him to increase our zeal for him is praying according to his will. Don't you? Don't you believe that that would be according to his will? That our passion that our mission, that our aim, that our purpose in life, what drives us would be to know Christ? Ask him to increase your zeal for him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, see and savor the glory of Christ, the Lamb of God, the true temple. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. And I'm going to close this sermon with prayer. Would you pray with me now? Dear Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this text. We thank you for the truth that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We thank you that he was sacrificed once and for all. Dear Father, we praise you for this truth. Father, we praise you that Jesus is the true and better temple, the true and better meeting place with God, the place where we're reconciled with you, Father. So, Father, would you help us to continue to see these truths and to savor the glory of Christ that we see in this text and all throughout scripture, that we would be conformed to his image and that that our zeal would increase. We love you, Lord, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand and sing and respond in worship.
The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son, who drank the bitter cup reserved for me. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. By your perfect sacrifice, I've been brought near. Your enemy, you've made your friend. Pouring out the riches of your glorious grace, your mercy and your kindness know no end. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you, the Father's wrath. benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you so much for coming today. May God bless you as you go. You are dismissed. <laughs>